Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. After a month of violence from commercial fishers and what he says is a lack of police response, a Mi'kmaq chief is taking legal action to protect his First Nations moderate livelihood fishery. Angel Moore has the latest. Chief Mike Sack of Sabaganagati First Nation was assaulted at a confrontation at the new Edinburgh Pound. The violence continued into the night. Commercial fishermen blocked the road leading in, into the lobster pound. Surrounding Sabaganagati community members, commercial fishermen are against the Mi'kmaq moderate livelihood fishery. They say Sabaganagati moderate livelihood fishery threatens the lobster stock. They're, uh, they're all walking around believing that they can do whatever they want and get away with it and take the law into their own hands. And uh, I'm starting to believe that's true. RCMP were on site, intervening during confrontations. Chief Mike Sachs said the lack of police response is systemic racism. Yesterday I had a lot of conversation with the RCMP. I woke up today with zero respect for them. They're not here to protect their people. Sabega Negati First Nation will be seeking legal actions against anyone who interferes with their right to fish. Meanwhile, for the first time in days, it is quiet at the pound for now. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Digby, Nova Scotia. What was supposed to be an update on COVID-19 in Indigenous communities ended up being about much more. For Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller, Jamie Pashagumscum reports. The Indigenous Services Minister started the meeting condemning events around the harassment of Mi'kmaq fishermen in Nova Scotia. These unacceptable acts of violence, including the assault of Chief Sack, threats and intimidation, some racist in nature, cannot and will not fetter the right of the Mi'kmaq people to pursue a moderate livelihood as affirmed close to 25 years ago in the Marshall decision. This is a right that has existed since 1760. Miller said the negotiations need to be allowed and it is the police's job to keep the peace during that time. Meanwhile, concerning the pandemic and alarming increases in First Nations communities, Miller mentioned specific outbreaks in York Landing, Little Grand Rapids, and cases stemming from a gathering from the Full Gospel Outreach Centre in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Despite the arrival of the second wave and 206 active cases in Indigenous communities, both uh, Miller and Indigenous so Services Medical we, Officer Tom Wong agree that Indigenous communities did a great job suppressing the first wave and serves as a good example of what needs to be achieved going forward. Uh, protect the elders and that's one of the things that uh, you know, First Nations on reserve have been, have been showing the world that during the first wave they have been able to protect the elders with uh, uh, no outbreaks uh, such as in the south uh, in the north, there's uh, no outbreaks, uh, you know, in uh, nursing homes, in elder lodges, uh, and long-term care facilities. And we need to learn, you know, from uh, the communities. We need to support them. Miller also announced details of an upcoming meeting Friday to discuss systemic racism in the health care system following the shocking death of Joyce Eshaquan. And the purpose of this meeting is for um, now over 200 people, including some of uh, Canada's top leadership, Canada's top Indigenous leadership to listen to those that have experienced it on a daily basis. Miller said he hopes the meeting will be the start of a path forward for Indigenous people living with racism every day. A second meeting is planned for January 2021. Jimmy Pashagumscum, AP10 National News, Ottawa. We'd like to hear what you think about the events unfolding with the lobster fishery or any other story. Here's how to continue the conversation. You can send your emails to news at aptn.ca, leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube to share your comments. On October 9th, one day before World Mental Health Day, Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation, and Manitoba declared a state of emergency. It's because of the alarming number of deaths by suicide. The nation recently held a suicide prevention walk to show support to those who have lost loved ones. Our reporter, Daryl Stranger, brings us this story from Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation. A memorial song began what was a day of support in Sioux Valley, Dakota Nation as the community held a suicide prevention walk. 
The community has seen 15 suicide attempts since January, and six people have died by suicide since March. So it definitely um, raised some red flags that, you know, we need to do more. We need to provide more mental health services here in the community and um, relying on our, on our health team, our health professionals to get their insight on what we need to do to ensure that all those services are, are provided. The community declared a state of emergency October 9th, stating they need help. Indigenous Services Canada confirmed they will provide $141,000 to Sioux Valley for mental health services. However, Bone says that is not enough money to cover the necessary resources they need, like four new mental health workers and a healing lodge. Sioux Valley Health Director Margaret Roselli believes past trauma combined with COVID-19 has led to problems like suicides in not only Sioux Valley, but other Indigenous communities. Well, I think it's well known in the many studies that have been done, the things that have happened to us in the past, that it's due to the intergenerational tra trauma that we've suffered through, you know, the Indian agent coming to live and uh, telling us how to live our lives and then having the 60s scoop and the residential schools and all those different assimilation practices that have been put upon us. And it's all been in our DNA. Uh, Joanne January. McKay has lost a family member oh, in the past wow. from suicide. Oh, she believes community gatherings like this, while under unfortunate circumstances, can help the well-being of the community in these times. I think we need more walks in, 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 in anything, in anything. We just need more walks because then it shows that, yes, these people care enough to come out in the cold, in the wind, to go for a short walk, you know. Maybe I can call one of them if they, if they you know, if they need to call somebody. They'll remember who was on the walk, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. An emergency response team arrived in the community to offer support and services as needed, and the second full-time mental health worker position is being added in the community. Daryl Stranger, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Time to step aside for a quick break. Still to come, details on one of the worst salmon runs in recent memory. Welcome back. Nations in northern BC have reported low salmon runs from the Fraser River in recent years, and this year was one of the worst. To increase salmon stocks, Takla Nation north of Prince George built a fish hatchery. Try to get the salmon numbers up. Lee Wilson reports. Takla Nation fishery manager Keith West is meeting with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans as they get prepared to release juvenile salmon into creeks. They're hoping to increase the number of salmon after 20 years of declining returns. These salmon come from a DOFO hatchery hundreds of kilometers away. But next year, Wes hopes the salmon will come from a local hatchery the nation now owns. According to the nation, this year, 14,000 fish were expected to make the run up the Fraser River, but only a few dozen made it. A decline in the fish that was in abundance when Tackle Chief John French was young. Tons and tons of fish here. Um, but now we're, uh, you know, in 2019, we have full counts in the last two years. Uh, only 84 early steward runs were counted in 2019, and 27 were counted this year. The Fraser River has two salmon runs the early steward run and the late steward run. Both can be treacherous for salmon. So the early stewards enter the Fraser River first, and they have a, a long migration up to up to Tacla here in our territory where they come and spawn. It's probably close to 1,200 kilometers swim for them. So they face challenges all along the way. There is a large list of potential decline causes. Overharvesting, global warming, logging. But one that is adding to the problem, the Big Bar landslide from 2018. Our history up here, there's been a couple of slides. There's another one back in previous years and uh, this last couple of years the big bar landslide has uh, affected them. Chief French says these salmon have been historically important to the area. 
we we did salmon here. Um, it, it's protein straight straight to the people. But but furthermore, it it also creates the whole uh, you know fertilization for the whole ecosystem. Wes says leadership in the Tacla Nation decided to purchase and run their fish hatchery as a pilot project. If they are successful in raising the salmon, they will have a release in the spring of next year. Everybody is in the north here is working hard to try to recover the stock. It's, uh, we're not necessarily trying to recover it to uh, commercial states, but just for um, biodiversity and we actually need them salmon. The land needs them salmon up here. Tackle Nation is also working with the Upper Fraser Conservation Alliance, a network of 30 First Nations trying to regain a sustainable fishery on the Fraser River, BC's largest river system. They hope these steps will turn things around for the salmon populations in northern BC. Really good collaboration that's starting to make a difference up here in the north. And a lot of people are really happy about what we're doing. And I think it's a, it's a really good thing. Lee Wilson, AP10 National News, Tackle Lake. The longest running residential school in Canada closed its doors in 1998. Now, one of the survivors launched a website about the last generation of survivors. Priscilla Wolf has more. Carrie Banjo is Soto, Dakota, and Cree, and a member of Muskaugan Soto Nation. On Ord Shirt Day, she launched her website about the Labrette Residential School in Saskatchewan. It focuses on the last generation of survivors. The project was part of her master's program with the University of Regina School of Journalism. When I started out in this project, I the reason I did it is because I'm um, the fourth generation in my family to attend residential school, and I'm the last. Labrette Residential School operated for 114 years and closed its doors in 1998. When Benjo attended the school in 1990, it was no longer run by the church, but by the Star Blanket Cree Nation. And she had a different experience than many of the generations before her. But what I found in the stories or the narrative of Indian residential schools is all the trauma and the horror that took place. And that, that's all true and that all happened, but for me that, that wasn't my experience. She realizes some survivors from her generation had bad experiences, but her story was positive. I really tried to tell the story that I remember, which was um, the halls were filled with laughter. Um, there were, I basically grew up with friends who ended up being my family and and being surrounded by people who were positive in influences in my life. And that's totally different from my parents' experience, but I, th I thought it was important to share this part of the story because there's a whole generation of us who have not had our stories told. One thing that stood out when she went back to the spot where the school stood is how her principal at the time helped shape her future by taking her grade 12 class to tour the University of Regina. He asked us if we were serious about going to university. He had paid for our application fee right there. And I think a few of us took him up on the offer. And yeah, he paid for it right there. And that's something a parent would do. And, and, and that's probably one of the best memories I have of of my experience. Benjo wants her fellow last generation of survivors to keep sending her stories and pictures from the Labrette Residential School to add to her website. Maybe I, it would have took me a long time to find my way, but because I had somebody who was there and cared and, and did something for me when I was young, it really helped shape who I ultimately became. The website can be found at menissa.ca. Priscilla Wolf, AP10 National News, Regina. Time to step aside, but coming up after the break, we've got a look at this week's new episode of AP10 Investigates. Maybe it's from the climate change, the ice is melting away and water getting bigger. From the waves, our land is vanishing.
Welcome back. Time now to take a look at our photo of the day. This photo was sent to us by Delaney Allen and captures some of the beauty of northern Manitoba. Here we see some rainfall over Kettle River near Gillum, Manitoba. Nice, and you can send your pictures. Uh, you can email your shot to share at aptn.ca and we'll do our best to get them on the air. Well, Friday looks like a snowy day for many parts of the country. Here's a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, 17 and sunny skies for Halifax, 18 and rain in Fredericton. Rain in Nain with a high of 10, 9 and showers in Kujuac. 12 with rain for Montreal and Quebec City, 5 with the chance of snow in Shibugamu. 11 in showers in Toronto, 6 with the chance of snow in Sault Ste. Marie. Snow is possible with a high of 4 in Thunder Bay, chance of snow in plus 1 in Sioux Lookout. Snow and plus 1 for Churchill, 0 with snow for God's Lake and Norway House. Plus 2 in Winnipeg, snow and 0 for Barron's River. 2 above with the sun out in Saskatoon and North Battleford. Minus one with snow in Uranium City, three below with snow in the Ranch. Over in northern Alberta, four below with snow in High Level, minus three and snow in Fort Chip. Snow and plus six for Medicine Hat, zero with snow in Edmonton. Rain and 14 in Vancouver, 18 in Penticton. Minus two in Fort Nelson, six with a chance of snow in Prince George. Minus 10 in Old Crow, a rain-snow mix, and a high of 4 in Whitehorse. Snow and minus 2 in Yellowknife, 6 below with snow in Wrigley. Flurries and 8 below in Saks Harbor, snow and minus 6 in Politech. Plus 1 under the sun for Baker Lake, 2 with snow in Chesterfield. Minus 2 in snow in Resolute, 1 below with snow in Joe Haven. Well, it's one of the Northwest Territory's most breathtaking national parks. But community members of the Nahani Butte, which is located just beside Nahani Park, say they aren't always reaping the benefits of the protected area. Charlotte Moore Jacobs has more. Nahani National Park Reserve. Dramatic landscapes with rushing rivers unfolding into ancient valleys that rise to remote peaks, a habitat for many animals, and home to the Naha Dene. Nahani Butte, the closest community to the park, just behind Tenako, a sacred mountain which lies at the base of the National Reserve, a cornerstone for Dene knowledge. But the story was Yamoria came and he put hole in there to, to scare the beavers out of that home. In 1972, the area was designated a national park. Locals advocated for the protection against hydroelectric development. My dad, my uncle, my grandfather, and that they really keep the land clean, everything clean. Mm -hmm. That's why they put the Nahani National Park in, because they wanted the beautiful country there, and they said that Virginia Falls, they're going to use it for the power and stuff like that. It was an exciting time. Well, when the park was formed back in the 70s, Pierre Trudeau came here and spoke to our elders. And sadly, it wasn't documented or put on paper. They were promised training, job, a lot of opportunities. Jane Conocenta worked at the park until a landslide in 1988 saw the park's headquarters move from Nahani Butte something she says was only supposed to be temporary. But since then, tourists who wish to go to the park leave by charter flights from Fort Simpson, a three-hour drive east of Nahani Butte. They just bypass the community. They stop in Fort Simpson, they do all their shopping or gifts, buying gifts, stay at a hotel and spend money there, but nothing here. Parks Canada says that many plans have been in the works to bring an office back to Nahani Butte since 2009 when the National Reserve was expanded. This office would be in place to house this, the positions that we do have in Nahani Butte. 
as well as serve as a, a bit of a an interpretive center for tourists that are ending their trips down the South Bonnie River. While there's no set date for when a new office or new park positions will go up, elders will be there to welcome visitors and share their stories when it does. Um, it's a beautiful place to live. I, I said, as, even when I was younger, mm -hmm. I said I would never move away. I, this is my home and I'm going to stay here and build upon it and make things better for us. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Nahani Butte. What a beautiful place. Well, climate change is happening now all over the world. But Inuit are seeing dramatic changes every year. Rob Smith continues his look at the state of Turtle Island on APTN Investigates, Burning Down the House, Part 2. Josh Ullerut has already given quite a list of changes he's witnessed in Nunavut in the eastern Arctic, something I've never considered. Melting ice is still a source of fresh water. We need water for our animals and we need water for ourselves too. On the flip side, there's more seawater. Years ago before at the shore, it used to be far. Maybe it's from the climate change, the ice is melting away and water getting bigger. From the waves, our land is vanishing. Hunters here are stressed. This year, I have noticed that there is no ice at all. Winter time is getting shorter. Winter, if I go to hunting by snowmobile, not enough snow anymore on the ground. It's getting harder to track animals here, both land and sea, and the cost of living off the land is going up. We pay about one barrel, one barrel, two hundred fifty dollars in Hobbit. It's, 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 it's a lot expensive money. We were here in the fall in the Arctic. That should mean snow. It's not snowing at all. It's very sunny. It's like summer. It's not, it doesn't feel like fall. You can catch the whole episode right here tomorrow night after the APTN National News. Well, after the news tonight, it's Nation to Nation. Here's a look at what's in store. Hello, I'm Todd Lamaran, and here's what we'll have for you on Nation to Nation. The rise in on-reserve COVID infections is causing alarm bells to ring. We speak to the chief of the Mississippawistic First Nation in Manitoba. Her community reinstalled a COVID checkpoint for people traveling north. As well, Northern Manitoba's Member of Parliament, Nikki Ashton, is concerned that the province isn't doing enough to keep people safe. And we hear from the Department of Indigenous Services. They say they're ready for a second wave of COVID. That's coming up right after the national news. And Todd is just a little less than two minutes away. And that's all the time we have for this Thursday. For more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.